this uh, lecture, Bezrat Hashem, Lilui Nishmat, Eliyahu Ilya Ben Tamara Yagudayev. Also, the Refua of Eliyahu Ben Sultana, the Refua of Rachel Hanna Batlea, the Atzlachat Netanel Ben Aliza, the Shmira of Atzlacha of the soldiers in Aza, the Dror Menashe, Barak Chaim, and Tzur Avram Bnei Hanna Elisheva. Also, Refuat Chaim Shmuel Ben Liba and Lerfuat Bat Sheva Bat Menucha Mincia. Leilui Nishmat Eliyahu Ilya Ben Tamar. Zivu Gagun Le. Regina. Regina. Nechama Regina. Bezrat Hashem. We are uh, almost 40 days into the war. 44 of our soldiers already died, unfortunately. Besides the 1,200 that died and 240 that are kidnapped. We wipe out more than half of Gaza and we still cannot find the hostages. One of the miracles, you know, there were thousands of miracles there. One of the miracles that I found out about is a family named Pitusi. It's a Saradi family. And they're living right there by the border with Gaza. And when they heard the, the terrorists go from one house to another and shooting people, they realized in two minutes they're going to come to the house. They come from one house to the, the other. They hear the shooting and the screaming. So what is the, how did the husband do? He turned the entire house upside down. Couches, uh, knock down things, the, the, the plant knocked down on the floor with the sand, you know, all over the rug. So when they came in, they already thought that other terrorists were there. So they skipped the house a few times, few groups, each group that came in, they saw the mess, they already assumed that they already visited this place. And they didn't go to check downstairs in a mamad, in a security room, and that's how they got saved. You see what it means when Hashem gives you an idea? One idea, save an entire family from death, or kidnap, or who knows what else. So, that, that was uh, really brilliant to think under such pressure to do such a clever thing. Who would think about it? Most people would freeze. They wouldn't know what to say. Today I found out that uh, 1,600 graduates of Harvard University stopped their monthly donations or annual donation to the university because of the university antisemitism and uh, what's going on over there, they decided that the university does not condemn Hamas, does not condemn terrorism. We, we don't want to do donate to them. But my question is, why these fools been donating to them in first place? How dumb you can be to donate to such a place that have billions of dollars in storage they don't know what to do with their money. They can buy half of Israel in one check. That's how wealthy they are. What do they need your donations, you bunch of fools? Even if, even if it was a kosher university, even if it wasn't an antisemite who teach heresy and rebel against God nonstop, who pro-terrorism and pro-homosexuality and all kinds of other nonsense, even if it wouldn't be such a filthy place, it would just be a kosher place. Who wants to donate to such a place? There are so many important causes that can give you such a reward on your money from all the places in the world. You choose a place like this that makes God angry every second. How sad it is that these 1,600 Jews are going to be punished severely for every dollar they gave this filthy university. They think they did something good. They don't know what's waiting for them. 
when the time come and God will show them how many horrible things came out to the world from this kind of money, they will regret the moment they were born. Forget about the moment that they joined the university and forget about the stupidity who made them give them money to begin with. But that's not only Harvard, it's almost every university, Columbia, Yale, any university. Any university, it's, a, it's an army that declare a war against God. Every university in America, in Israel, even in Barilan University, the university was made by Rabbi Barilan. I personally know his grandson. His grandson is a tzaddik. I don't know the father. So the grandfather was an orthodox man. The grandson is an orthodox Talmud Chacham. He writes books. I spoke to him a few times in Alacha. I don't know who the father, but I should assume that the father was also some kind of a rabbi. So when he made that Barilan University, did he ever dream that they're going to have courses over there, how to destroy your family and how to do abomination? Legal courses. They actually teach the people to become sodomized people. It's a part of the agenda, they're part of the schedule. Rabbi Zamir Cohen once sent them a letter about one of their advertisements in the newspaper, what course they're offering to the public. And he said to them, I'm sure that the founder of the university never had this in mind, that you're going to do such horrible thing that even Gentiles are embarrassed to even do such thing. So they answered him, maybe the way we presented it was not proper, but we're not going to cancel the course. So that's Sodom and Gomorrah, Barilan University. It's similar to the university here in Manhattan that claimed to be Jewish. It's also belonging. Also full of heresy, also full of modern people who redesigned the truth of God. Hundreds of hundreds of times I repeated that because it's such an important thing. And we're going to see it tonight when I'm going to speak about the parasha we read on Shabbat that one of the most important thing in life as an observant person, a Jew or a Gentile, you want to be a religious, righteous man or woman, you have to know and learn carefully what's the right Jewish ashkafa in the eyes of God, meaning Jewish ideology. If you do not know the proper Jewish ideology, you're going to find out when the, when the day you leave the world that almost every hour of your life you did horrible things in the eyes of God who got him very angry and very disturbed from your, from your behavior, from the things that came out of your mouth, from the things you admire, and mostly from the things you supported financially because that caused the biggest damage. People that support all kinds of open orthodoxy, which is basically another word for reform Jews. Reform. Supporting reform synagogue. You know how, what a crime it is to donate a penny to a conservative or reform synagogue? It's worse than to don't ma donate money to the Hamas mosque. It's worse. Hamas are murdering bodies. They are Nazis. Nazis murder bodies. The Torah says if you murder a soul, it's a million times worse than to murder bodies. You murder a body, if the body was righteous, if that person was righteous, he go express to heaven. You murder a soul, that person lost his eternity. What's worse, to lose 20, 30, 40 years of life because someone murdered your body, or to lose billions and trillions of years in heaven? What's worse? The answer is obvious. There's nothing to even compare. Anyone who, who thinks that to murder a body is worse than to murder a soul has zero knowledge in Judaism. His knowledge is very, very limited. He has no idea what what's what's this world is about. So that's why you see a lot of Jews that have yarmulke on their heads and they join on all kinds of modern Zionist organizations, supposedly Jewish, which there's nothing Jewish about them. Include that university in Manhattan. 
There's nothing Jewish about them. Nothing. They destroy Judaism. They promote horrible ideas. They constantly modify the truth of the Torah until it became a different religion. You understand what's happening here? If you see that, all, that everyone almost who comes out of this place became such a rotten person, admire Christian uh, missionary Nazi to his synagogue, publishing all kinds of fake Torah, all kinds of things that they do over there. You know, if I would just tell you some names of some people that are famous, the things that I heard in my ears on a phone call from them, if I would publish what I heard from them, that would be a disaster. A disaster. People that consider high authorities, the kfirah that comes out of their mouth, the ideology that they have, they are so influenced by the Goish uh, books that they read, a lot of these modern Jews, they constantly read all kinds of scientific books and all kinds of culture of Americans and Europeans, and it gets mixed with the Torah that they learn, it becomes such a salad that now one hour that comes out of their mouth is authentic. Nothing. It's all mixed with garbage. And I don't have to tell you that if you take the cleanest water in the world, 10 gallons of water, 10 gallons, pure spring water, filtered, the best. And all you do is take a drop of here, yeah, a little bit water that are black and dirty, full of germs, and you spill it inside. Do you know anyone who wants to touch the 10 gallon of this water? The entire 10 gallon goes to the garbage, to the toilet. Why? Because once you have heresy mixed with the truth, that's even more dangerous than 100% heresy. 100% heresy, if someone speaks about Buddha that should admire him and bow down to the idol, Buddha will save your life. You don't have, you cannot be that stupid. Someone made up a statue in Thailand or in India or I don't know where, and now I will have to bow down to this piece of metal hoping it's gonna make my life better. You have to be super stupid to believe it. I believe that Jews are not that dumb to believe this nonsense. But when someone comes and says, oh, God and Moshe and Torah and this, and then he mixes his rotten ideology inside, most people cannot tell that it's mixed with poison. And when you mix poison with food, that's when it kills the person. Because if you hand the poison only to a person, he won't agree to eat it. <laughs> but when you mix it in his rice, you mix it in his soup, you mix it with his coffee, it's delicious while he's drinking it and you'll know the results of it. That's the problem that most Orthodox Jews today have no idea what Ashkafa is. They don't understand. So I would like to repeat it for the 500 times. There is one way you can learn Jewish Ashkafa. It will take you a few months overall, but it's worth every hour you put into it. All you have to do is to buy all the books of the legendary, holy, righteous Rabbi Avigdor Miller Zatzal. Just buy all his books. Don't ask me which one. All of them are treasure. It's hard to tell which diamond is greater than the other. They're all diamonds. So if you cannot afford to buy all of them, buy a few. No matter what you buy, it's good. Don't worry, you don't have to worry about it. Whatever book you buy, you begin to read, believe me, you'll buy the rest quickly after. And that's when you know that now you learn pure Judaism. If you learn in all these modern places, you're gonna have a lot of warning sirens going into your head when you read these books. You see how much nonsense was put, in, put into your head over the years? That's when you know how much your Ashkafa was all wrong and full of poison. Until you read these books, you may be dreaming that you're a kosher Jew. Now, I once explained it many times, actually. In order for a person to be a complete righteous Jew, he needs three things to have in him. One, he has to be great with keeping the mitzvot, the commandments, not to, not to break any laws of the Torah, and to practice all the positive commandments, meaning the whole 613, most of them are not in effect today, they're not so relevant because we don't have the temple, 
some of the mitzvot is only for women, some is for someone who slaughter animals, someone is, some is for a judge. If you remove all these mitzvot, general mitzvot for men or women, it's a few dozens of mitzvot, that's it. Not even a hundred are in effect weekly. So if you keep those mitzvot, you avoid breaking any laws of the Torah, you have one third of the obligation you have to fulfill. One third. That's it. It's only one third. You can still fail. You can keep all the commandments and still fail in a general test. What's the second third? You have to fix all your bad traits. Got to get rid of your pride, your ego, your anger, your jealousy, your laziness, your stinginess, your selfishness. There's so many things we have to fix in our daily life. Who can raise his hand and say, I'm perfect in a midot? Even people that look perfect, when you speak to them one-on-one, -on -one, they'll confess to you that some, they have some weaknesses. How do I know? If they didn't have any weakness and all their personality traits were perfect, they probably already would be in heaven. There's nothing for them to do here in Queens. You know? So that's the second third. Keeping, fixing all the personality traits. The midot. Tikuna midot ze kola adam, the gaon mi vilna se. Fixing your personality traits, this is what the human being is all about. So if you keep all the commandments and you fixed all your midot, you have two-thirds already. That's very good. But the most important third out of everything is the ideology. You have to think like God think. You have to love what he love and you have to hate what he hate. When you hear the news, you walk to a place, I don't know, doctor's office, and you hear the news. If you have Jewish Ashkafa, you want to vomit. Five minutes news. Five minutes news, it's enough to vomit ten times from the nonsense they talk about when they describe the war, when they speak about the politician, when they speak about the gay marriage, when they speak about demonstration, when they speak about taxes. Everything they speak about is heresy. In Israel, and needless to say, in the United States. Almost every commercial on the radio is heresy. Even cartoons is full of heresy. Every cartoon almost is a crime against God, especially the Disney ones that they show the kids today. It was designed by the filthiest people on earth, all kinds of abomination people. They already brainwashed the children from very young age to kidnap their soul to the devil. That's why they show you boys with boys and all kinds of words that comes out of their mind. Why? To poison the kids. No wonder why America looks the way it is. This is where it starts, from a very young age. Naive parents want their kids to watch cartoons that they have uh, some quiet while they're cooking or doing things. But they don't know it. As they're doing it, they're destroying the souls of their children. So you've got to be very, very careful what you let your kids watch. Even cartoon is dangerous. Needless to say, movies and other things they show. So obviously, a righteous person doesn't bring television into his home and no internet, and if he needs internet for his work, he has to be extremely careful and restricted and put filters and do not let the kids ever touch it without supervision. One hour over there and you lost the neshama of your kids for life, for eternity. One hour, you don't need more than that. To eat poison and to die, you need, you need a minute, not more than that. To destroy a soul sometimes can also be a minute or two. One idea he got from seeing it, and he will go and search for other things. From then on, you lost your child for life. How many parents are calling me every day, begging me, save this one from intermarriage, save this one, save this one from doing that, save. Now they wake up <laughs> after so many years. Someone is in uh, drugs for so many years, in one minute you think you can save them. Uh, so the third thing is Jewish ideology. How you look at the Israeli army with all the gratitude we have. First, one thing is you have to have gratitude to every human being, even wicked ones. Needless to say, people that are willing to risk their life to save you, which is now the Israeli soldiers. Many of them are not Shomer Mitzvot. They're not religious. Some of them are atheists. Some of them are abomination people. 
Some of them hate God. Check their social media, what they post. But now they're risking their life to save every one of us. Some of them get injured, some of them died. Me having gratitude to them doesn't mean I support their wicked lifestyle. We have to know not to get confused. Sometimes people tell me this organization is very good in kindness. They do a lot of act of chesed. I say yes, but they are idol worshippers. Yeah, but look how much good they do. Christians also do good, so you become Christian. Just because Christians go and visit the, the cancer patients in hospital and bring them gifts and play guitar for them or bring clowns to make kids happy in a hospital. Is that a sign that we have to become Christian? You know how many Arab murderer terrorists also do shows for their children and give them candies and ice cream? So what does it mean? That we're going to have to become ISIS now? Because ISIS make a puppet show to their little uh, terrorist kids after they brainwash them that they have to murder all Jews from a very young age. Just because someone does something good doesn't mean that is a righteous person. Even the most monster people in history, if you evaluate the eight years of life, you can write a book on how many good things they did. They gave money to their children, they helped them with their homes, they paid for all kinds of things that they needed, they paid for their surgeries, they paid for the doctors, they did a lot of good things. If you check, the biggest monsters in the world, they did also a lot of good things. It doesn't mean we have to be one of their groups. So we have to know what Ashkafa means. Gratitude, yes. Admiration for how much they're willing to put in the, to risk their life to save every one of us and to stay in Israel. Yes, cannot be ungrateful. Just because you hate Zionism, just because you hate the wicked communist people who came and made up that army and made up all the rules against God, and the army is not mothers, boys, girls, mixed, girls are not mothers, uniform, Hashem Irachem, food, kosher, not kosher, horrible, wicked people are in control, all kinds of abomination people give orders. The army is not a kosher army, but right now they're willing to die to save you. You have to have gratitude. You have to have a gratitude to a secular Jew who risks his life, to a secular Jew who does good thing to you, who help you with a flat tire, to a non-Jew. Even an anti-Semite goy, an anti-Semite uh, Gentile, who did a favor to you, even a small favor, you have to have gratitude. This is Jewish Ashkafa. You can never be an ungrateful person. But get, don't get confused. Having gratitude and endorsing his wicked actions are complete two different things. Make no mistake. I thank you very much. I appreciate what you've done for me. I'm willing to pay you as much as I need. But I despite your lifestyle. It makes me want to vomit the way you are, the way you steal, the way you care, the way you fill up your body with tattoos and all kinds of weird earrings, the way you break Shabbat, the way you eat refot, all kinds of horrible things. And the most important thing to despite the rotten ideology. There is no God, we have to take care of ourselves. Come and easy, basically. Come and easy. So, Abotai, there's so much to know. How are you going to learn Jewish Ashkafa? Where are you going to learn it? You went to yeshiva? If you went to yeshiva, a good yeshiva, serious one, for many years, and you had great rabbanim who give shiurim and musar and Ashkafa, okay, there is a chance that Baruch Hashem, you're a good product right now. But most Jews, those who become religious with the years, where did they learn Ashkafa? They never went to yeshiva. Whatever they learn is from listening to speeches, to lectures. So now when you, when you listen to, to lectures or when you finally read a book, you have to be extremely precise who you're listening to and who you're reading his books. Not everyone is kosher. I can show you chief rabbis of England. One is more heretic than the other. One after the other. You cannot count them in a minyan. You have nine people in Yom Kippur. You want to take out the Sifre Torah. You want to say Kaddish. You cannot count them in a minyan according to Halakha. You cannot count now the chief rabbi of England to minyan. You cannot count him. He's not counted as one of the ten Jews. 
Why? <laughs> if you see a list of the things he does, you understand why you cannot count him in Minyan. And he got uh, whatever they give over there, the King of England, you know, give him some kind of a ser, ser title. That's good for the fake word, ser, ser, you cannot count him in a Minyan. So here is just an example of how dangerous the world is. Not everyone that has a title or looks very religious, that means they know Jewish Ashkafa. And if you, you don't have to count on me, put me aside. I'm just throwing this bomb here tonight. Go and research. Take Rabbi Victor Miller, everyone knows he's a legend, he was top authority the biggest in Ashkafa in our generation. In, in Halacha, Baruch Hashem, we had hundreds of great Talmidei Chachamim. But in Ashkafa, and he was very brave, he answered every one of his answers with no fear from anyone, which is very rare. Because today everyone is trying to be politically correct. He's gonna get offended, she's gonna get offended, they're gonna get hurt, they're gonna say, maybe better not to say, me. With him, it was sharp like a knife. You want the truth of the Torah, that's the truth of the Torah. Well, he spoke about sensitive issues, which most rabbis are afraid to even write about it. But he spoke about everything, and every one of his answers is a treasure. Why? Because when someone is the Shem Shamaim for the sake of heaven, not for money, not for greed, not for honor, he has perfect midot, live holy life, learn in the best yeshivot, and, and his devotion to God was in such high level, that's when HaKadosh Baruch Hu helped that person to aim always to the truth. Always. Because no matter what, he will never agree to change a word from the truth for any amount of money in the world. I used to know one rabbi like this, Rav Moshe Malka Zatzal. He was like that. He had no fear, no shame from anyone, just from Hashem. He was attached to Hashem in such level, it was scary to be around him. When you knew Rav Malka come to the house, or come to, we go to Shiur and he's about to enter the place, you had to think a hundred times what you're wearing, what to say, what not to say. Why? Because you knew around him there is no nonsense. You know, if it's enough, you would see the kippah that you have. It wouldn't be an orthodox kippah his eyes would come out. He one time went to Mexico for Shabbat. They told him, Rabbi, you, you sleep in the house of this uh, family. He arrived a few minutes before Shabbat. He see Mexican Jewish kids sit on the floor and watch TV in Spanish. Now you're a guest in the house of a family. They're hosting you for Shabbat. You're supposed to perhaps eat by their table soon after davening. You know, so they're doing you a favor. The, the, the hospitality. He see Jewish religious kids watching Spanish TV. He took the TV, disconnected it, and threw it out of the window. And he said to them, I'm very sorry, I cannot see Jewish kids being murdered while I'm here. It's my obligation to save them. Tell me after Shabbat how much this TV costs you and I'll pay you. This is the way it was. His level of truth was too much for most people. Most people couldn't, couldn't even, you know. He heard that the yeshiva goes to play soccer every Friday to do some exercise. Psh, you had to see, it became like a torch of fire. Wasting your time on such nonsense. What's in it? He gave us a whole two hour speech about the game, how humiliating it is and how it's all ego and, and the Greek culture. And this is the way it was. And Emuna in Hashem, beyond words. Emuna, psh, scary. Such confidence. Zero fear. Zero fear. But because you have such a person, when he speaks to you, it's an immediate impact. Immediate impact. Even if you raise completely crooked, you're very modern and rotten and you have the worst ideology and someone like that speaks to you five minutes, you begin to shake. Because the Gemara said, Someone that is a God-fearing Jew, his words are heard. 
meaning people are shaking when they hear it. Even if he caught them by surprise, they're totally shocked. You know, and they already begin to think about it. Why? Because of the, the level of zealousy to Hashem and the holiness and the confidence in the truth, it makes a big impact. You know, I saw some, some rabbis like this 10, 20, 30 years ago, Baruch Hashem, slowly, slowly, they're all leaving the world. Slowly, slowly, so what happened to the world today? You see the level of the new generation, you see the teenagers, you see what's happening around. It, it breaks the heart. But I want to tell you something. We had a very big tragedy 40 days ago. Huge tragedy. There was since the Holocaust. In 75 years, we didn't have such thing. Of course, it's going to take many years to digest what really happened, and a lot of news is yet to come out. I hear already some secrets of what happened there from people inside, which didn't go out to the news yet. Soon, more and more people get more shocked and more shocked. Eventually, slowly, slowly, it will come out. But one good thing happened. You know, in every tragedy, there's also something good. You may ask, what, can, what good came out of the Holocaust? Millions of people were butchered and this. What good came out of it? That you have a, a country to the Jews with thousands of yeshivots and synagogues, and they still, still are able to sit and learn Torah. It's still not against the law. The lefty liberal traders still did not make a law in Israel that you're not allowed to learn Torah. They are close to it. If this tragedy wouldn't happen, it was a matter of six months until they'll make it illegal. You know, they're going crazy now. They see all the soldiers becoming religious, speeches of generals with kippah on their head, inspiring the soldiers. Soldiers from Tel Aviv, from Haifa, that never went to one hour of Torah class in their entire life. Immediately put tzitzit, say, Shema Israel, Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach. The lefty attorney general and all the other wicked lefties in Tel Aviv are going crazy. So a few days ago they say, we record all the evidence to the crime who is committed by the Israeli generals. As soon as the war will be over, we will prosecute all of them for publishing religion to the soldier. They have a word for it, Hadata, making Jews religious. It's against the law in their mind. This is it, this is Israel, it's not Rome, Rome or Greek, you know, it's, it's, it's Israeli lefty. Do you know how much they cry for every Hamas terrorist who dies? They try to hide it. They go to the house in Tel Aviv and cry for Ahmed and Mustafa who butchered a lot of Jews. Just yesterday there was a judge in Machshimo in Tel Aviv that now you know you don't go to court physically because of the situation and it's been done by Zoom. So there were some prisoners, they were in one place, and the judge is in a different place, in a courtroom. But they have now a, a, they have a court case by the Zoom. So behind the terrorists, there was the Israeli flag and a sign, Am Israel Chai, the nation of Israel is alive. The judge, Imach Shimo, refused to start the Dune until they removed the Israeli flag and Am Israel Chai. He refused to start. They told him why, which, why, why, what does it have to do with the court case, he said. They told him, you sit in the courtroom, there's still the Israeli flag there. He said, yes, but where you are sitting, it's not supposed to be a courtroom. Why did you push into the camera the Israeli flags and Am Israel Chai? They told him to inspire our people, a lot of us died here. So that's inspiring, giving us a comfort. So he refused to start until they remove it. That judge protected the Hezbollah murderer in Harvard University one time. This is the kind of judges we have almost in every courtroom in Israel. Mamash, an ideology Nazis, that's what they are. They may not murder with a gun or with the gas chambers, but they will do everything they can to destroy Israel. Do you understand why I've been telling you for years that the biggest enemy of the Jewish nation is the Israeli Supreme Court? The biggest enemy. 
more than the Greek Empire and the Romans and the Babylonians and more than anyone, that group of horrible, wicked judge who hates God more than anything you can imagine and hate the religion more than anything you can imagine. As results of that, everyone who is traditional is their enemy. And they are the judges and we are their victims. If you come to the courtroom with the Yamaka, automatically you lost the case. No chance for you to win. Nothing. Immediately the judge become the lawyer of the other side. Openly, with no shame. If you go to the court here in Manhattan and you have some anti-Semite judge, anti-Semite, he will do everything he can to hide it. He will try to show that the, the court case is uh, objective. In the end, when he writes the ruling, he's going to stick the knife to your back. But until then, he's going to try for the record to pretend that he's an objective judge. He's not going to put you down and start giving advice to the other side. Because they're going to fire him. Because then you cannot be a judge if you take one side and give them legal advice. In the middle of the court case, you, you became a... You became a defense lawyer of, of the one of the sides. He obviously cannot be objective. But that's how it goes in Israel. Every case, as soon as a kosher Jew comes in, he lost the case. The, why do you think they fought so bad and with demonstrations and riots that they cannot overpower the, 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 the power of this wicked Supreme Court? Because they know they can do anything they want against Judaism. It's a stamp in their hand, whatever they want. Judge, okay, okay, because the judge hates Judaism. So every time there will be a case that we want to make Israel a little bit more Jewish, immediately they'll cancel it. So they know once they lose the Supreme Court and you're gonna put more observant judges, more conservative judges, like Trump did. He put two, three judges here. It saved a lot of things already in America. So they know if they're going to put some judges that are more traditional, more into Judaism, then they lose the government. They cannot be, a, they cannot be in a government, in a Knesset, and they're not going to have the Supreme Court. They basically, you, you finish them. That's why they're willing to burn Israel, to lose Israel, just not to lose the, to lose the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is 100% control in Israel. The government are a bunch of puppets. There's nothing they can do. Every time they want to do something, they get a phone call from the Attorney General in Machshima, and she said, I'm giving you 10 minutes to apologize and to fix what you just say in a news conference, because if you won't, I will start a legal action against you. Two minutes later, forget about what I said. Is why? Because they control you. They hold you by your neck. There's nothing you can do. Even now, when we are fighting for our existence, they do everything they can to damage the efforts to save Israel. Everything they can. Even now, they do demonstrations in Tel Aviv against the war and against the innocent Palestinian. Find me one. Good luck with that. That doesn't want all Jews dead. One guy from the government said to Netanyahu, Netanyahu is also half lefty. That's another problem. Half and half. He didn't make up his mind where he wants to be at. So he told him, what do you expect? That we'll kill hundreds of thousands of people? So they, you want us to kill innocent people? So the guy answered him, everyone who give can, candy and dance when our children being butchered and burned alive, it's not innocent. Innocent is an Arab that cry, look what they did to the Jews, poor Jews. Why they do such things? That's an innocent Arab. One who on the street and dance and play drums and give candy and flowers, kill all Jews, that's innocent. What's innocent about him? He's a Nazi. When they bombed Germany after the Holocaust, no one in the world say, be careful on innocent Germans. Why? Because almost all Germans were Nazis or pro-Nazis. None of them demonstrate, save Jews, how can you kill innocent babies? In Germany, Hitler brainwashed them and they all were going for it. It's not that millions of Germans stood every day on the street and made riots. We will die to save the Jews from Auschwitz or from other places. No, they went along with that. They were very happy with that. 
So when the Allied dump bombs in Berlin and everywhere else, nobody say innocent Germans are dying. Same thing with ISIS, same thing with Al-Qaeda, same thing with George Bush, the father, attacked in Afghanistan after September 11. Now one person in the world said, be careful, you're killing innocent Afghanis. Why? Al-Qaeda was there, Bin Laden was there, we bomb where they, yeah, there's the, the war, some people get hurt, there's nothing we can do about it. Well, when it comes to Israel, the hatred that the people have towards the Jews always twist their mind into being not objective, doesn't matter the truth. And everything I told you now, I'm going to show you now in a parasha. What do you think? It's possible? The entire now, half an hour that I spoke, it's all in a parasha we read on Shabbat. And I'm going to prove to you how you see it all in a Torah. Everything I told you now, you're going to see in the next hour right here in the parasha. Vayu chaye Sarah, we talk about the life of Sarah, the first mother of the Jewish nation, the wife of Abraham. She lived 127 years. She should have lived longer life. The Gemara say why her life was shortened. Because after Abraham took Hagar, and had Ishmael with her, and, and Hagar was making fun at Sarah and disrespecting her, I became pregnant right away, and you already married for 75 years and still don't have kids. So what happened? She disrespected her, and Sarah was offended. She came to Abraham and she said something very, very dangerous. What did she say? God, will judge between me and you. Don't ever make this mistake. Whenever you have an argument with another person, Jew, non-Jew, you think you're right, he thinks he's right, he may know that you are right, but he's a crook. You know, you have cases like this. Even when you're 100% sure you're right, and this person is a crook, is deceiving, and is obviously not, not, you know, not fair, don't ever say the word, God will judge between me and you. Because when you say the word, God will judge between me and you, God has to check both of you, not just him. You think he's the monster and I'm the angel. Maybe in this particular case, yes. But there's a lot of, a lot of related things that God has to check. For instance, what he's doing to you, maybe you have done to other 500 times in your life. He just forgot. <laughs> right now, someone is doing to you, someone insulting you in public. It hurt you very much. It wounded your reputation. So you now say to him, you know, if you won't publish a denial and apology, fine, I'm not even going to do anything against you. I leave it to God. He will judge between me and you. Okay? The Satan takes your words and say to God, please, he asks for judgment, fair judgment. Let's check this person. How many times he insulted people in his life? Wow, again and again and again and again. Wow, what a, what a mess you got yourself into. That's why even when you complain and when you blame and you ask for justice, check first who you are and how perfect you are. And since we know now we're far from being perfect, better never to say these words. Do not give permission to the court of heaven to open your case. The Satan is already going to do everything he can to reopen your case every day, to get your situation worse and worse based on your behavior. But why would you volunteer to do such thing? Just like when the police come to you, would you give uh, DNA? No. Oh, what, you have something to hide? No. So why don't you want? Come on, one swap. Open your mouth. No, you need a warrant. Why are you afraid to give DNA? You know you're innocent. You're not, you, didn't, you didn't go there where they suspect you for something you never done. Because for this particular thing, you're innocent. But they, maybe they find something else in the future about you. You never know. That's why people refuse to give. Oh, why, you have something to hide? No, I just don't trust you. Not to talk about that I can plant and put your DNA somewhere. Can't trust these people. But this is just to give you an idea. It's enough they already want to get you into trouble, the prosecutor. Why giving him ideas? 
Why are you giving him ammunition? That's what Sarah did here. She comes to Abraham, Hamasi Alecha. She said the word Hamasi Alecha. Who came from Ishmael? Hamas. But this, the mistake she made is Hashem will judge between me and you. As a matter of, as because of that, her life was shortened. She lived only 127 years. Abraham lived 175 years. She should have lived longer life. So Rabotai, why we call the parasha the life of Sarah, Chayei Sarah? Because we speak about her death, not about her life. The answer is because the real life begins in a moment of death. This life in this world is no life. Every person in this world is in the process of dying. No one gain life. We are getting closer to the death. From the minute you're born, your battery begins to die, right? When your battery is 100% on the phone, once you disconnect it from the charger, what's the right term? My battery is dying. It's not leaving. It's in the process of dying. Until it gets to the 5% and it becomes red. Your last month arrive, or your last week of your life. So we all are in the process of dying. There's only one problem. With the battery, you know approximately how much time you have left. If you're 100%, you know it's going to last five, six hours, whatever it normally does. And in the, in the battery of your life, you don't know how long it will, it will last. It can be a day, a week, a year. Nobody knows. That's a hidden mystery. Since we do not know when we're going to leave the world, we have to assume that in the next minute it's going to happen. In the next minute. And since it's going to happen in a minute from now, are we ready to start our trial in one minute in Shamayim about our entire life? Did we repent? That we fix all our mistakes? Did we pay back all the money we owe people? Did we fix every mistake we ever made? Did we apologize to Hashem for doing horrible things against Him, for being ungrateful, for doing all kinds of bad things? No, we're not ready. But the Satan is putting in our mind, don't worry, you're young, you're only 40. Still have at least 40 more years to go. Where is the guarantee? No guarantee. But he's willing to take a risk. Another day and another day. There is still time to repent. Rabbi, when I'll be 70, I'll be Shomer Shabbat. <laughs> Why? I mean, look, I, I admit there is a God. I know the Torah is from God. I, I mean, I admire the religion. But it's now not convenient for me to be Shomer Shabbat. How will I go to the picnic? How will I barbecue? How will I visit my parents? How will I go to the pool? How will I fly to my conventions? It's, it's, it's on my way. It's going to slow my career. He already has guaranteed that he's going to live another 70, 40, 50 years. What, what if he doesn't? Many people left the house, already made plans for the next week, what to do tonight, dinner plans, and a minute later they're gone. Especially what's happening with anti-Semitism now. There's no guarantee that anything will happen. No, we don't know anything. So, why do we call it the Chayei Sarah? Because now her life really begins. Once a person is sent to heaven and is going to cash out on all the good deeds that he did, it's eternal. The problem is that not everybody make it, make it there. Some people will never make it to heaven, unfortunately, because they don't keep the laws of the Torah. They ignore God, they ignore the, uh, the mission, they ignore the obligation. They ignore the covenant he made with the Jewish people. And they ignore the purpose of their life. You ask them, you live already 60, 70 years. How much time and effort you put to succeed in your mission in life? He will say to you, excuse me, I don't even know what my mission in life is. How can you succeed in a mission when you don't know the mission? Most secular Jews have no idea what they live for. Ask them, what are you living for, Mr. X? To make money, to be healthy, to have children, to enjoy the weekend. 
everyone with this different nonsense. What's the purpose of life? Almost nobody knows. Goim Chlal have no idea, but even secular Jews have no idea. What's the purpose of life? To enjoy. To enjoy, you can be a monkey. They enjoy much better from life. They don't have to pay three million dollars to buy a house in a Jamaica mistake and pay the mortgage 30 years and taxes and the rest of the nonsense. They don't have to be in traffic four hours to get to work back and forth every day and such anger every day just to bring bread to the table. They don't have to deal with all the nonsense of life. They're nice in the jungle, wake up in the morning, jumping from the tree into the lake, <laughs> enjoying. They don't have to raise children with so much agony and pain. There's no drugs issue, issues there, no psychologists, no depression. Nobody loses hair, nobody gets gray hair. No jails, no prosecution, no IRS issues, no anti-Semitism, no Arabs. Wonderful life the monkeys have. Or an eagle, even better. From here to Israel, in less than a day, free of charge. You don't have to pay $5,000 in economy with the lal. And you don't have to worry that the flight will be delayed and you have to sleep somewhere in Europe. Life of the eagles, life of the monkeys, and life of some of the dogs is better than the life of Bill Gates. So if that's the purpose, just to enjoy life, how come almost no people enjoy life? Life is full of anger and agony and frustration and disappointment and lack of achievement and sicknesses and physical pain and spiritual pain. Anyone can raise his hand and say in the last 40 days he had a happy moment? Happy moment in the last 40 days? All day, news, news, videos, WhatsApp, this, look what happened to him, look what happened to her, kidnappers, this, that, anti-Semitism, riots, demonstrations. You know how many guns they sold in the last month here in New York? Go to the gun shops, ask them how many guns they sold. The Jews live in fear here. Do you know how many Jews now from England and France are begging to move into Israel and buy a house? Who would want to move to Israel after what they saw? The answer, smart person. Because he knows if I might as well be under attack by the Nazis, I better off be in Israel together with all my brothers. Here in England and France, when those Arabs come and attack and they come to burn houses, who exactly would save me? I call the French police or the British police. Half of them hates me just as much. Why would they risk their life to come save me from the mob? So that leads me to believe that real estate in Israel will double in the next year. As it is, it's already the most expensive in the world. Now it's going to double. Why? Because there's no Arabs to build no constructions. It will take time to bring Indians and Thailandese and Chinese to teach them, I mean, they know already construction, but to teach them the Israeli system and this and that, it's gonna take months. Everything in Israel was built by Arabs all these years. The Arabs were working and working in, in construction. You cannot let them in. You have to be super stupid ever to let one of them in. You can't. I hope they're not dumb in few months to start giving them job permits. Because all the spies who arranged this massacre were all workers who work in this kibbutzim that come from Gaza daily with job permit. They told them the name of every family. They knew the houses by, by last name. They knew which luck is broken. They knew everything. They had the list. They, yeah, you don't understand. They, the, the workers that come and work and smile to you and you make them coffee and sandwich as they're collecting information that tomorrow their brothers will come and slaughter you. Not only that, some of the terrorists were workers. In the videos, they recognize some of them as people who worked in the kibbutz. So they've been taking care of them, giving them money, paying them, giving them parnasa, and they came to slaughter them. And you know what's the worst part? Most of the people who got slaughtered and burned alive were lefty liberals, like Bernie Sanders. There were hundreds of Bernie Sanders 
in this 1,200 people who got burned and raped and kidnapped. Some of them sitting in Gaza being tortured and they gave their life for the Hamas. That's what's happening. A lot of people don't know what's going on here. At least two thirds. Lefty from the kibbutzim. Now they say, how, oh, how didn't we see it? We believe in coexistence. We hated religion so much. Everything the religious people were speaking, we automatically went against them. We have to apologize. Some of them are at least honest. We have to apologize. We have to apologize. We never believe it's possible that they'll come to butcher us. I say that for years. Now, when the Arabs will have the opportunity to kill Jews, the first one they'll kill will be the lefties. Why? How did I know? How did I know? What, prophecy? No. The Torah says, everyone who kiss up to the wicked will fall in his hands. Guarantee. That's what Hashem said. You kiss up to the wicked, Hashem will make you be his victim. But there's another reason. One Arab once say, if we one day take over Israel, we will kill everyone. So they ask him, but why will you kill the lefties who helped you, drove you to hospital, pay for your surgery, fought for rights for you, sponsor lawyers for you in jail? Why will you do it to the lefties? So what did he say? Because the lefties are more dangerous. They are traitors. They betray their own people. How can we keep them alive? We want to live with traitors. Do you understand what they say? And that's what happened. Too late for them now. Now they, they, some of them are dead, some of them are... Their life will never be the same. Even those who survive, every one of them have friends that die, family, children, parents. Terrible, terrible what happened. But I want to tell you one thing about time. Never, since I remember myself doing Kiruv in 28, 29 years, we never had such a month that we made so many ballet tshuva. Never. You don't have to do that much. One video, 10 minutes, and that's it. People asking how to become religious. People asking, where do you have more tzitziot? People are now joining the chevrutot 300 per day. We never had days like this. Set up Hevrutot with religious people to learn on Zoom. To learn on Zoom. People are with a big trauma. For the first time in the history of Israel, every Israeli, almost every, almost every, today understand that if we don't stick to Hashem, we'll be finished. No one could save us. That's it. Most people already got the point. Now it's a momentum. We cannot miss this momentum. A lot of people are waking up. But, you know, when you have more demands, when you have more demands, you need more money. You need to send more USBs. You need to send more TCO. You need to send more things for the people to become religious. What happens when you have a uh, hundred people are interested and you only have 10 or 20? What do you do? You lose the, the 80. Why do you lose the 80? Because you have Jewish billionaires around here, Queens, Brooklyn, Long Island, who keep their millions and billions and they rather keep it forever until the Uncle Sam will eat it one day, you know, or, or his bank will eat it up, instead of saving souls. People think that by saving souls, they're doing Hashem a favor. It makes Hashem very happy that you save his children and, and reconnect them to him. Of course, nothing makes a father more happy to get his children back home in a decent situation. But you are not helping Hashem, you're helping yourself. You are the one who will get rewarded from those people who become religious for eternity. For it, they will save you in a judgment. Because when the Satan come and show all the horrible things you did in your life, you have no chance to succeed. But then when the defense lawyer will come, the angel will come and show how many Jews, thanks to you, are keeping mitzvot, how many of them are learning Torah, how many of them became religious, and how many mitzvot them and their children are doing every day, 
that can turn the entire scale into the positive side. Because it's such a productive reward and such a life-saving to your own soul, the Satan will do everything he can to prevent it. Anything he can. And that's why only very few people invest in Kirov. Very few. No matter how many times I explained it to them, you know, it helps maximum for a month. They give a recurring automatic donation on my website. Two, three months, they cancel it. Why? The Satan doesn't leave. Does not leave you alone. They get the credit card bill, 100, 200 dollars a month. They spend it in a lunch. One time, more than that. But the Satan will do everything he can to bother you about this tiny monthly donation. How much garbage you waste your money on? If you look at this credit card report, almost everything he buys is nothing. He won't even open the pack. How much money people waste on watches and clothing and shoes and exchanging cars? How many cell phones they exchange every year? Another one and another one. Oh, I lost my phone. Another one. Stop. They don't care about money. We're not talking about stingy people. Stingy don't want to give to anything, not just to, to save souls. Talking generous people. Let's go to a restaurant on me. Come, all of you. $800 dinner. No problem. He pays it. Charge my card. He sees someone in a restaurant. Oh, Rabbi. I didn't order dessert. This guy paid for it. How much? $200. There's no problem. Ask him, give $200 to save souls. We'll make five, six, seven ballet tshuva with this money. He won't be able to. To buy a stupid cream cake and some sugar things who kills the person faster, there's no yetzerah. It's ego, it's honor, people respect you, you're generous, it's a show off. For that, the Satan push you to be generous. To spend money on all kinds of stupid causes, the Satan is the one who drives you to do it. Upgrade your Mercedes, get this kind of roof, and this kind of that, and extra tires, and this, and this one. But it's another $17,000. No problem, enjoy life. Give him, tell him, give $17,000 in 10 years to save souls. He cannot do it. Why? Again, not because he's a Kamsan, stingy. Because 17,000 extra on a Mercedes, it's a sin. With no shame. But 17,000 to save souls is the greatest mitzvah. Who do you think is going to give you such a bonus? You deserve it. You have to earn such a... To be worthy. To invest in the right place, you need merit. Not that many people even understand Kiruv. Some people, you talk to them about Kiruv, they don't know what you want. What does it mean, Kiruv? It means to take a Jew that doesn't know God, doesn't know Torah, doesn't know what he lives for, and in one month make him Shomer Shabbat, Tres Mades, Put Filin. Do you know what the impact it's going to make in Shammai? Every one of them that goes back to Hashem. I can give you hundreds of souls, this is not the, the, the topic now. Let's move on. Vata Motzara Bekiryat Arba. It's in Hebron, Hebron, next to the Me'arat HaMachpela today. In the Holy Land. Vayavo Avraham lispod lesara velifkota. Avraham comes to do, to make a eulogy and to cry for the death of Sarah. When did Sarah die? What day? What, what happened at that day that caused her to die? The Akedat Yitzchak. Abraham was 137 years old. Sarah was 127. She was 10 years younger. Abraham took Yitzchak to the Akedah when he was 37. And Sarah found out that Abraham is going to slaughter her son after she waited for him for 75 years. It broke her heart, and she dropped dead. That's what happened to her. Now Abraham is coming back, finding out that after he passed the test and he didn't have to slaughter Yitzchak because Hashem told him enough, you don't need to. Now I know you God-fearing person, gave him a great blessing. Why did he just found out? 
as results of what I've done for Hashem, that's what I deserve to get, that my wife died? Not one question by Abraham. Rashi says that uh, it's written over here, Lispod Lesara Velivkota, to make a eulogy for Sarah and to cry for her. Rashi says it should have been, this Rashi should have, this, this explanation should have been in a verse that Sarah died. Not when Avram came back. First, when you speak about the death of Sarah, you should already speak about the eulogy and the, and the cry. So, Rabotai, listen carefully. Well, we're we going to learn a very important foundation here. When we look at the Akedah, the test that Hashem gave to Avram, take your only son and sacrifice him for me. In the Moriah mountain, that's where Bet HaMikdash was, in Jerusalem. When the test was finished, Avraham is going now back with his donkey, with Yitzhak from Hebron, all the way to Jerusalem. The test, the test of Avraham taking his son to the, to the altar in the Moriah mountain, is ready with a knife to slaughter him, and Hashem stopped him, and said, don't even make him a scratch. And he falls everything and he's on the way back. The test finished or no? Or the test is still going on? Once the angel say to him, do not dare to touch him, don't even reach your arm to him. Don't make a scratch, don't do anything. That minute, the test is finished or no? Or it's still going on? That's the question we have to ask. The answer, Abotai, when Abraham gets to the house, what does he find out? And his wife just died as a result of that. Now comes another huge test. What? We have a rule in the Torah. When you commit a good deed, you just did something wonderful. Is it yours for eternity or you can lose it? I just put fill in today. Anyone can take the reward away from me or no? I made a bracha now for the water. I just earned my reward for it. Can someone rob my account? Is it like Bitcoin? You come in and someone stole your wallet and there's no way to prove? Or once it's yours, it's yours for eternity. What do you think? You saved the soul. You became Shomer Shabbat. Every mitzvah he keeps now goes to your account forever. Can you lose that soldier or no? He's producing mitzvot for you daily. Or once you did the good thing, it's yours forever. The answer is, usually what you do is yours forever and nobody can take it away from you besides yourself. You are the only one who can cause yourself to lose all your merit in one second. All you have to do is to say that you regret that you did it. You help someone for years, you give him tzedakah every month, charity, someone who learns in yeshiva. Every month you send him a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars, for years. It's already a hundred thousand you gave him over the years. One time you found out he spoke Lashon Ara about you. He comes, he eats on your Shabbat table, he saw something that is not 100%. He went out and spoke about you. That's his gratefulness to you. Ah, I was in his house, this, that, he's angry, he yelled, he's tough, he's not tough, he's lazy. Something that is not bringing you great honor. You found out, you went crazy now. Such an ungrateful monster. For years I'm giving him money, this is how he going and talks about me. I made a huge mistake, I should have never given him a penny. Chaval that I gave him money, this low life. Once you say that, I wish I would not give him a penny, you lost all the rewards of his Torah. For years he was able to learn Torah, 
you just regret at giving him money, it's called tohe al arishonot. You regret something positive that you did. So what are you going to do from now on? You want to stop giving him? Fine. But don't ever regret what you already done. Do not ever say, I should never invite him to my house. I wish I would never feed him. I wish we will never open the house for him. I wish I would never give him tzaka. Well, a word like that make you lose all the good things that came out of your money. Now when Abraham comes and he sees that his lovely wife died, what's the first reaction should be? This is what I deserve to get. I go to sacrifice my son after waited for him 75 years with no hesitation and Hashem testing me. He, t- he sent me to go and sacrifice my son and now I come back home and I found out as a result of me being extra righteous that my wife deserved to die. I should have never agreed if Abraham would think or say I should have never taken Yitzchak like Hashem told me. I should have not agreed because look what just happened. He would lose the reward of the Akedah. We would not read it every morning in a Shachrit or on Rosh Hashanah we read it. Do you know how many tragedies it saves from the Jewish nation, this Akedah? What do we say in the morning when we pray? Before we start the tefillah, right away in the beginning. Look at the ashes of Yitzhak Avinu and remember the sacrifice that our first father made for you. Meaning to ease the Satan instigate constantly against us. Remember the shofar that was made from the ram that Abraham slaughtered instead of Yitzchak. The Zohar, the Kabbalah, said that the soul of Yitzchak went into the Rem. Because Yitzchak really died from fear. There is such a thing that a person died from fear. The fear killed a person. The heart stopped working. Don't live. Yitzchak really died that moment. And his soul came out and went into the horse, the Rem. And what happened? He got a new soul. Yitzchak got a new soul in Yakeda. And because of that, he was able to have kids. Until that time, he could not have kids. So it was actually an exchange in his soul. Why did I say a horse instead of a man? Because there was a case like this a hundred years ago in the time of the Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim sent his student, Rav Elchanan Wasserman, Hashem Ikom Damo, was killed by the Nazis. Rav Elchanan Wasserman, Zatzal, Chafetz Chaim told him that there is a 12 years old girl in a barn that someone's soul went into her body. And she speaks with the voice of a man. A soul of someone that died entered her body. And uh, they went there with 10 people to take out the Dibuk. It's called Dibuk. And they asked the man, what, why did he get permission to enter the body of a 12 years old girl? And the answer was, because the girl was eating and doing things without bracha. And that second, that soul of that wicked person was right there. So they did what they did. And they were able to take the soul out. It took them a week, a week, until he agreed to go out. And uh, if I remember the end of the story, he went into that horse. There was a horse there. He said to him, go into the horse. Once he went into the horse, the horse fell and died. That's, called, that's such a thing called dibukim. Do you know what dibuk means? Everybody have one soul. Right now, me, you, all of us have one soul that moves the body. The voice is the, the soul makes the voice. The soul thinks, see everything. The soul remember everything. Everything is recorded in the soul. But the soul was here in, in past life, in different body. It's called reincarnation. Now, what happened if another soul will enter the body? Two souls in one body, what happened then? Then it becomes a battle between two souls. Reuven and Shimon, they're fighting who will take control of the body. It's like two drivers 
two captains in a boat have a wheel. You know in a boat they have big wheel? They're pushing each other. Each one wants to take control on the wheel. When Reuven pushed Shimon, Reuven now is moving the wheel to the right. When Shimon pushed Reuven, he takes the wheel back to the left. Meaning there are two souls over here. When one soul takes over the mouth, you hear his voice. When the other person takes over, you hear a different voice. Sometimes it sounds like a conversation between two people from one mouth. Sometimes a man of a voice of a man, sometimes a voice of a woman. We had a case like this 20 years ago in Dimona in Israel. A woman that her husband got into her body and speak from her throat. I don't know if you saw that video. Rav Batsri and other Kabbalists with shofars, they went there, few hours, everyone was praying for this woman until they took out the soul out of his body. Then later they made an article in the newspaper that they spoke to his son. Tell us more details. I mean, we only saw what happened in the day of the, of the rabbi's camp, but what happened before? He said, for one month before, my father would come and speak to me from my mother's throat. My mother would faint on the bed, and her mouth is talking, and he keeps telling me, shame on you, look how you look. When are you going to stop with your nonsense? Why don't you put Phil in? His father was telling him. And the interesting part is that his father, when he died, was not even religious. He was an alcoholic. How did he die? He drank too much vodka, and when he went to sleep, he vomited in his sleep and choked. But one very interesting thing happened. In the middle of the Dibuk, when the rabbi tried to convince him to leave his wife's body, they asked him, what should we do for you that you will agree to come out? Guess what he asked? He wants vodka. <laughs> I was wondering, now you're already not in this world. You are suffering in Kafakela, the worst tortures. And you want vodka? Don't you know by now that's the last thing you should worry about? But it took me years to understand the answer to this question. You see, when a person is sent to hell, there are seven different sections in hell. Shiva Madore Geno. Depend on what sins he committed. If he committed all kinds of sins, he has to go through all seven. One time, second place, third, fourth, fifth. Each place clean from different sins. They cleanse the soul. It's like cleaning silver with fire. But to go to hell, it's a huge merit. Because you know you are one step before going to heaven and collecting your reward. But you cannot enter heaven when your soul is full of stains from your sin. So because you did not repent and you didn't fix your sins, now God has to clean your soul forcefully, which is very painful, but very productive. Once you're done with the gain or with the hell, you can now go into your place in heaven and stay there. But there is something worse than hell. It's called kafakela. It's written, Ve'et nefesh arasha ikla'ena bekafakela. The soul of the wicked people are being in space. They are being shot from one place to another with a slingshot. Kafakela, like David killed Goliath with a slingshot. The angels are shooting that soul from one place of the world to the other, and the soul has zero rest. No rest. And the angels have uh, whips of fire, and the person is suffering. Words cannot describe. While a person is in kafakela, it's not productive. It's 100% revenge. It doesn't purify the soul. He is the same wicked person, the same desire, the same crook, the same everything. Once he will enter hell, then the cleaning will begin. This guy, the father that went into his wife's body, he didn't make it to hell yet. He was still in kafakela. Someone who goes to hell cannot enter a body because it's not in this world, is Neshama. It's not moving in space. Only those who are in Kafakela can come back in the book. It took me years to understand because I was wondering how can it be that a person was already in the next world and wow, now he wants vodka? In the middle of the book, he said, what, would you, what should we give to you? He said, give me vodka. I want to drink vodka. 
But one interesting thing, he was giving a lot of respect to the rabbi. Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav, and he mentioned another rabbi. That used to be, he's not alive anymore. That used to be a very influential speaker making ballet tshuva. He mentioned his name as well, very interesting. But I went off topic, let's move on to this. So what do we see over here? So Abraham is coming and he finds out that what he just did for the sake of heaven cost him in the life of his wife. And still not one thought against Hashem. Willing to sacrifice his son, not one thought against God. So that his wife died in the same day, not one complaint in his mind. Forget in words. In words is needless to say. The Torah would say if he says something. The Torah didn't say a word that Abraham said against God. But the interesting news is that he didn't even have one regret. This is the level of faith he had. Nimza, con conclusion that the death of Sarah was a direct continuation of the test of the Akedah. Now I want to remind you, in case you don't know, it's written in the text of the Torah, the Book of God. Vayi achar adevarim ha'ele v'ha'elokim nisa et Avraham. After those things, God tested Abraham. How do you test a person? Take your son, your only son, the one you love, Yitzchak, to the place I will show you in the Moriah mountain and sacrifice him for me. Not one word. How can I do such things? My son, I waited for him. You promised me he's going to inherit me. Nothing. No questions asked. Not only that he's happy. 5 a.m. he was already on the road. My Ashkem Avram Baboker. Someone tell you tomorrow you have to slaughter your son for me and you waited all your life for that son. Would you be able to fall asleep that night? I don't think one person will be able to fall asleep that night. Avram went to sleep. How do we know? Vayashkem Avram Baboker. He woke up in the morning. Vayashkem meaning very early. Not like today, Rabbi, there's Minyan at 10 o'clock. What's the rush? <laughs> 10 o'clock. Kriyat Shema was 8.30. 10 o'clock, you only show up to shul. <laughs> joke. People are not, not thinking straight. So, Rabotai, Avram does not have any regret. Now we understand why Rashi brought this Midrash of Sarah, the death of Sarah, close to the story of the Akeda. Should have spoken about it in a different place. Lispod le Sarah But now we have another thing to understand here. When uh, a lot of the commentaries, the commentators, they ask a question, why does it, why it's written in the Torah, Lispod le Sarah means to make a eulogy for Sarah, Lifkota means to cry for her. What comes first, eulogy or crying? When you found out, Lo Alenu, that your wife died. Right, right away, you begin to cry like crazy. You, you can't breathe. The eulogy will be tomorrow in a, in a, in a wedding. In a, in a wedding. In a funeral. Tomorrow in a funeral. So right now you cry 24 hours until you got to the eulogy. But it's written in the Torah to make a eulogy for Sarah and to cry for her. It's the wrong order. The right order should have said, should have said to cry for Sarah and respond to You get the question or no? This is the way of the life. Immediately you begin to cry. But Abraham refused to cry for Sarah until after she was buried. After he bought Marat HaMachpelah, buried there in Hebron, he bought it from Ephron, the crook. And now after Sarah is already buried, Avram cried very little for her. Lifkota, it has a small half there in the leather. Why Avram is so uptight? Just cry. It's natural to cry. It's not a shame to cry. 
Your wife just died. Cry. Why are you holding your crying? The answer is, Rabotai, now we learn another level of the greatness of this legendary holy man, Abraham. No wonder why the whole world admires him, 3,500 years later. What's the, the extra level of greatness that he has? After he passed such a test with the Akedah, if he would cry for the death of Sarah, it would be a big Chilul Hashem. The people that were so admired now that he was able to sacrifice his son with no questions asked and he ran 5 a.m. in the morning. He didn't stretch it all day. Someone told you to take your son tomorrow to slaughter him in a mountain. You would leave 10 minutes before sunset. Invite all the friends, Persians, Bukharian, come say goodbye. Hug my son Yitzchak, you'll never see him again. Right? It would be a whole thing. You wouldn't run quickly at 5 a.m. to rush to kill him. After you waited for him 75 years. <laughs> but Abraham knew, if on the way, when he arrived to, the, to, the, to Hebron and found out his wife died, he would start to cry. People may understand that he regret that he did the mitzvah of the Akedah. And that would be Chilul Hashem. He did everything he can not to cry. Not even one drop was holding himself not to cry. Why? Naturally, I want to cry. It's a very good relaxation when you cry. And, you know, it makes you normal. If you don't cry, it's very hard to hold the tears. But if I will cry, all the people around would say, you see, even Abraham regrets what he did. Look what he got instead. His wife just died for this mitzvah. So Abraham didn't cry. After she was buried, now you do the eulogy. Now I want to ask you a question. When you cry for the dead, you cry for yourself or for him? When you say eulogy for the dead, you say eulogy for yourself or for the dead? Is both of them for the dead? Or only one of the two is for the dead? What do you think? The answer is, Rabotai, in Midrash Rabbah. This is what it says. Ve'avu Avram lispod l'sara. It says, first Avraham made a eulogy for Sarah. And that's when he started later to cry for her. If he would done the opposite, he would look to the whole world that he regrets the mitzvah that of the Akedah. That's why it was very, very precise not to show any regret before the burial. But we know that there is a difference between eulogy and crime. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 47, the Gemara says, eulogy is to give respect to the dead, to give him comfort, to relax him, because he's going to the unknown. He sees his funeral right now. All his family, all his friends, everyone crying now. They speak all the good things he did in his life. It is the pain and the panic because there is no worse moment in the life of a person than this hour from the minute his soul came out of the body until he enters the court of heaven and his trial begins for one year. The stress, the panic, the fear, the confusion is the worst it's ever been. The worst. Even now what the people in the south of Israel, what they had to go through that Shabbat, panic, confusion, death, horrible tragedies, is nothing compared to the panic of the soul when a person just found out he died. Especially when it's by surprise. If he was already 90, he knew in one month he would leave the world. Okay, so it gives him time mentally to prepare. But if he's young, someone just came and shot him, like it happened to 1,200 people now. They didn't plan to die that day. 
So a person young, 20, 19, 22, boom, got a bullet. His soul comes out, he sees his body on the floor, bleeding in the face. It takes him a few minutes to understand that he's dead. He sees everyone running, screaming, and the, the Arab monsters coming to shoot other people. He sees how everyone else is dying. And now the panic begins. Wow, I'm supposed to get married. I was supposed to go this week to choose the, the wedding gown to my fiance. We just put a down payment on an apartment. We just ordered furniture. Wow, my mother, my, my parents, my grandparents. If it's a mother of children, first thing, wow, what's going to be with my kids now? If it's a wealthy man, he has a lot of hidden monies everywhere. He doesn't know, wow, what's going to be? I hid money here and there, I have investment, I have annuities, I have all these things. I didn't even tell my wife yet. How will I, not, not, how will I inform her where I hid all the cash? The Swiss bank will eat all the money now, the Cayman Island. So many things comes to his mind, he's in the middle of a real estate project, he's in the middle of a court case, he's in the middle of so many things, he didn't write a will, he didn't say goodbye to his kids, he just helped his wife a few hours ago, didn't have a chance to apologize. Yeah, so many things comes to the mind. So he's going crazy, crazy. And before he even digests what just happened to him, the trial begins. His soul goes up to Shammai, and they announce his name. Ah, they realize, wow, what the religious rabbi said is true. I never took them serious. One year trial, that's why he said Kaddish, one year to help him in a judgment. But the first week, the soul can still go from the grave into the house where they see Shiva. How can it be? The trial began. The soul split. One part of the soul goes to the grave and remains there for eternity. That's why we go to the grave. Otherwise, what? You come to speak to the wall? Why would you come speak to the wall? Why we go to the western wall and speak there? Why are we speaking to a wall that was built 2,000 years ago? was destroyed 2,000 years ago, was built 2,400 years ago. Why we speak to the wall? We don't speak to the wall. The Gemara said the Shekhinah, the Spirit of God, is on that wall and will never leave. Because the Shekhinah of Hashem is there, it's like a direct meeting with God. That's why even the Goim can't put Yamaka and kiss the wall. Even the Goim understand that. One guy got married in Bnei Brak. The wedding finished around midnight, and he said to his newly wed, we have to go to the Western Wall. She said to him, man, I'm exhausted from all the dancing, I'm sweating, I'm dirty, let's go to our new place or hotel, whatever. Let's... Come on, we're excited, we waited for months for this moment. Yeah, yeah, we waited six months, we'll wait two more hours until we go to the house. Why it's so urgent for you to go to the wall now? Let's go tomorrow afternoon. Let's go home. I waited for you, you know. No, no. So his father comes and says, son, don't be stubborn. Why do you insist to go now to Jerusalem? It's an hour drive, an hour to come back. It's Chabal. No, dad, I want her to get used to talk to the wall from today, not tomorrow. <laughs> I have to prepare her. Don't expect me to listen. You can't talk to the world that you get used to it. But the good news is when you speak to the world in Jerusalem, you're actually speaking directly to Hashem. But the question is, Rabotai, if the person died and his soul is already in the court of heaven, how the soul goes from the grave to the place where they see Shiva back and forth for seven days? The answer is because the soul can be, first of all, in two places at the same time. Because it's not physical, it's a spiritual thing. So to go from here, let's say I'm right now here in Queens, if I want to be in Great Neck now, it takes me less than a second to be there and less than a second to come back. We don't go by the law of physics. From here to there, driving 60 miles an hour will take 20 minutes. No. So, shh, shh. Everywhere, it can be everywhere, in few places. 
Because remember, it's 100% spiritual. Just like the speed of light. 300,000 kilometers per second. It can go from here to Israel in less than a second. Why? Because it's something spiritual. So what happened over here? The soul, the part that remains in the grave, that's the part that will rise the body in the resurrection of the dead. If a person deserved to resurrect in the resurrection of the dead, if he was righteous, if he was wicked, if he was Mechalel Shabbat, if he was a murderer, he was an idol worshiper, etc., someone like that doesn't get, come back in the resurrection of the dead. But if he was a tzaddik, or even if he was wicked, but the, towards the end of his life he became righteous, meaning he repented, and he was buried as a righteous person, even though most of his life he was wicked, but the end was good, everything goes acharachitur, everything goes after the end of the trial. In the beginning, everything looked terrible against you. But then the last minute, some new witness came and turned everything around, and the judge dismissed the case. Nobody remembered the few weeks. Everybody remembered the last minute. Not guilty. Goodbye. That's it. Same thing over here. All your life, you mechalel Shabbat, you did horrible things. Two, three, four years before you became Shomer Shabbat, if your woman started to get modest, starting to eat kosher, believing in God, praying, changing their lifestyle, becoming mamash angels in their behavior. As a whole new creature now. The person that used to be and the person that now is completely two different people. So in the end, it counts like he died as a righteous. But if he died Mechalel Shabbat, there is no chance whatsoever ever to make it to heaven. And there is no chance ever to resurrect in the resurrection of the dead. And anyone who tells you otherwise is nothing but either mistaken or a liar. One of the two, you choose. Because it's written 12 times in the Torah. I will cut that soul permanently. Cannot go against the verse in the book of God. You can speak as much as you want. What's written, that's what's going to be. However, there is a chance that he will be reincarnated again. The fact that we are all here it's very possible that in our past life we were Mechalelei Shabbat. But Hashem sent us back to the world that in this life we will be able to fix it. So if we die in this life already Shomrei Shabbat, if Hashem will send us back in another incarnation, we won't have a desire to break Shabbat. Because in our past life we already fixed it. If we fix the stealing, when we will reborn, we will not have desire to steal. If a woman fixed her lack of modesty in her past life, she will be born as a modest, down-to-earth girl, shy. She's not to show off, running everywhere to show her body. She doesn't have that desire. Why? Because she fixed it in her past life. If you see for a very young age, all she cares about is to show herself everywhere, especially today with the social media, posting pictures, getting all these likes. Then you know she had that problem in her past life. This is her main test in life. So everything that you are wicked with now, that means you didn't fix it in your past life. That's why you can have twins, two boys. One very stingy, the other one very generous. Same face, same delivery. One Kamtsan doesn't want to give one pretzel to anyone from his bed. And the other one take the whole bag. Well, how can it be? They bought one year old. Nobody ever told them about being stingy or generous. I might have, or maybe I have 500 bags of pretzels. Give as much as you want, I'll give hundreds of bags for you. They have no indication if it's good to give or bad. No one ever taught them that. But that's how they died in their past life. One died generous and the other one died stingy. The one that died stingy is born stingy because he has to fix it. The other one who already fixed it, why should he go through the test again? He has different issues. Anger. He's very generous, but if you say the wrong words, he's willing to choke you. Calm down. Don't tell me to calm down. One guy walks in the street. Someone spoke to him a world or two and he got angry. He said, wow, why are you so angry? What did I do? So somebody told him, hey, Moshe, why are you such an angry person? 
So people make me angry, so I get angry. If nobody gets me angry, I'm not angry. So Baruch Hashem. Imagine you walk on the street and nobody talks to you and all of a sudden you get angry. Then you need to be in a mental place. You walk in the street and get angry on the trees. Of course someone will get you angry. That's the whole point. You have to test your anger. Fix your anger. So Rabotai, you're getting better now. <laughs> It says that uh, when you make a eulogy, the eulogy is to pay respect to the dead. It eases pain. Look how, many, how people came to pay you respect, look how nice they talk about you, they mention all the good you did. If a person wrote in his will not to make him a eulogy, humble big tzaddikim, they wrote, do not make me aspect, don't make eulogy. Why they don't want eulogy? They don't feel comfortable that people compliment them. They're very humble. When people compliment them in public, they don't, want, they don't know where to hide. They get red like tomato. Why? They suffer because they're down to earth. They're very humble. They don't like people to give them credit. I had a funeral in front of hundreds of people. Now they're going to say, he did this, he was such a tzaddi. I can testify it feels horrible, especially when the nature of the people is to exaggerate in the eulogy, to say things that are, let's say, not exactly 100% true. He gave $5 for tzedakah, he made it $5,000. He added only a few zeros, no big deal, Rabbi, I'm trying to give him respect. He was the first one in the shul every Shabbos, but he forgot to say that he was in the minyan that starts at 10.30. <laughs> so no, uh, do, do I have to say all the truth? You know, it reminds me, who was the first billionaire in Israel? When everyone was extremely poor, people didn't have shoes. Seven brothers and sisters wore one pair of shoes. They kept fixing it. I asked my father, my father was one of those, he was the, young, the youngest. So I asked him, I don't get it, if your oldest brother passed the shoe to his second and the third and the fourth until it got to you, what, these shoes will remain forever, 20 years? He said, oh, we kept patching it, because there was no way to get shoes. So I asked him, but ma, all of you were the same size? He said, no. One was nine and a half, one was 11. How someone that has 11 will, will fit in shoes of nine and a half? The answer, the first shoes you got were very big. You know, so if it's still too small for someone that has huge feet, they cut the front, that the toes comes out like sandals. So imagine being a kid in Israel in 1946, 1945, when the Brits were in charge, used to get food stamps, get a bag of flour, and that's how you survive. You just make bread, nothing to eat. <laughs> Lots of Arabs there. There's no Israel state there. It's before 1948. And what do you do? You wear clothes of other people. You never have no clothes. No, nobody had no clothes. It's the same family again and again. They saw, they, they fix, this is how it was, and everyone was happy. But there was one billionaire already, in billions. One guy, Shaul Eisenberg. Shaul Eisenberg, he has a business called Asia Israel, Asia Israel. How he became a billionaire? Somehow he made a deal with the Chinese government that he will sell them aluminum and metal. But you know, Chinese government, it's like a like hundred different countries. You know how much metal you need in China, in aluminum? He was selling them metals and aluminum and made fortune, became a billionaire. He owned a big building in Dizengoff in Tel Aviv, Bet Asia. He was already a billionaire. But he was a Holocaust survivor. He was a kid. His parents, like the whole family died. He survived, came to Israel, became a billionaire. But no religion. And I saw his son trying to say Kaddish in his uh, funeral, I didn't know how to read. Every word he made a mistake, so you saw that's the first time in his life he heard Kaddish, that he has to read. 
you can see that they didn't have Jewish education. But the story goes, Shaul Eisenberg was a survivor and he had one cousin who survived, female. That's it, from the whole family. She came to Israel, he went to Israel. In the beginning, they were a little bit in touch, then she, got, she was religious and he wasn't. She got married to a religious man in yeshiva, in kolel. They had kids, Baruch Hashem, many kids. When the first kid got to age 18, 19, they now start, they need to marry their kids. They need a lot of money for the weddings, for an apartment. So what happened? Until now they survived by miracles. Hashem took care of them. Now the husband is Avrech, she works. They actually survived. Now the husband told her, we're going to need every year a lot of money for weddings, for apartments, furniture. <laughs> you need a huge miracle to survive. Where are we going to get so much money from? Your cousin is the richest man in Israel and one of the richest in the world. Why don't you pay him a visit to his office in Tel Aviv? So I'm embarrassed for more than 20 years, I didn't speak to him. He doesn't even know about his kids. We never invited him, no Brit, no nothing. Why all of a sudden I'll show up, Shaul, I need help? He says, listen, you have to choose to take the shame and maybe you'll be able to marry all your kids with dignity, to spare the shame and the kids won't have any, a penny to get married. What would you like? It was an emergency. She said, okay, I'll go. The next day she goes to Tel Aviv. She showed up, the secretary, can I help you? I'm a cousin of Shaul Eisenberg. Tell him, whatever her name was, Rifki, Rifka. Tell him, Amir. They went inside. Your relative is here. Her name is Rifka. Ma, she came here. Wow. He came out. Wow, what a surprise. Where have you been all these years? It was very friendly to her. Come in. What brings you here? She said, I, this is the situation, I'm so ashamed, forgive me, I know I'm wrong, we never kept in touch. Believe me, if I wouldn't need your help, I would do everything I can not to show up here today, but I just don't have any other option. She told him the story, they're having a wedding soon. He said, wow, of course, that's nothing for me, you should have come all these years, I would help you all these years. He said to the secretary, Give her now a check for 100,000 liras. There was liras before the shekel. It was like a huge amount of money. And make sure every month to send her 10,000 liras or shekel, whatever, automatically every month. Make sure you send her a check every month for this amount. They marry all their kids, they didn't have to worry about Parnassa anymore. And it was not religious at all, this Eisenberg. What they passed, all the big ambassadors, ministers, Chinese people, Koreans, from all over the world, he had a huge funeral. All the prime ministers, Mossad people, very fancy funeral. Half of them were going, diplomats, politicians. So the daughter of Shaul Eisenberg said to that cousin, religious woman, would you like to say eulogy for my father? You're the only relative we have. We even didn't even know we have a relative. Now a woman, religious woman, doesn't stand in front of 5,000 people and give a speech. It's not modest. But gratefulness, it's such a critical thing in life, it can never be ungrateful. She didn't know what to do. There's no rabbi to ask. She just couldn't say no. She said, okay, let me speak. She got up on a stand and she said to all the prime ministers and the politicians over there, all of you been speaking and saying wonderful eulogies for Shaul Eisenberg, my cousin. We bought Holocaust survivors who came to Israel young. And this is where we are today. All of you complimented Shaul for all his financial achievement and power. Everything that he left in this world and could have not taken it with him to the next world. I choose 
today to compliment him from what he took with him to the next eternal world not for what he left here for what he took with him to the next world and then she told the whole story and all the goyim Chinese, Korean, Americans the goyim were crying because in the end everyone knows the truth Everyone knows life is a blink of the eye before you realize it will be over, no one will take his will to the next world. King Solomon already wrote it in his will. <laughs> so, in the end, everything will be heard. Fear God, follow his commandments, because this is what the human being is all about. Not financial achievement, not this, not that, not talent, positions, nah, shtuyot. Nobody will care about this. So, Abutai, so now the eulogy is to pay respect for the dead. What if a person said not to make a eulogy for him? We have to listen to him or not? Or we have to ignore his instruction? The answer is we have to listen to him. Why? Because the eulogy was made for his honor. If you want to give up the honor, we must listen. But crying, crying is not for him. Crying is for the family. The family needs to cry. It's a, some kind of a comfort, relaxation. When we come and cry together with them in a funeral or in a house when they see Shiva, we pay respect to the family, not to the dead person. To the family. And the same thing with Abraham. If he will cry, the crying is for the family. What well, is the family? What's the point? And if he cry, people may think that he regrets the mitzvah of the Akedah. Later, the eulogy is already for Sarah. When he comes, he makes a eulogy for Sarah. Last thing for today, and the rest I will continue tomorrow. So now Abraham needs to buy a grave. He needs to buy a grave. They told him, there is a rich man, a boy, his name is Ephron. Ephron Achiti. There were seven nations living in Israel in those days. Apoizi, Knani, Yevusi, Achivi, Achiti, all these nations. He now, this guy, he is in the city of Hebron, where we have the cave of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, Merata Machpelah, that the entire area belonged to him. He owned real estate. So now they say to Abraham, go buy for me a land. He comes to Ephron. Ephron says to him, ah, What's 400 coins of gold between me and you? Eh, it's peanuts. Two lovers like us. Meaning you are the president of God among us. We look at you, Abraham, as the representative of God. Nasi Elohim ata betochenu. You are the representative of God. Remember, I want to remind you, the Torah wasn't given yet. This was uh, 300 years before the Torah. So there is one Hebrew, Abraham Ivri, one legend, one holy man. They all go him admire. Nimrod threw him to the furnace and he came out alive. He went to the war against the kings to rescue his nephew Lot. He won the war by miracles. Plus, he became a very, very wealthy man. He has 318 servants, messengers. His messenger Eliezer, Evet Knani, also very righteous guy. And he had lots of camels and cattle and sheep. Uh, what's not to admire? He comes to this phone. The phone is honored. You want to buy land from me? Uh, you're embarrassing me, Rabbi. Mine is yours. What's 400 shekel between me and you? Immediately Abraham gave him the full price, which was overpriced, by the way. The Gemara say, you know what's the difference between righteous and wicked people? Wicked people, righteous people, speak a little bit and do a lot more than what they say or promise. Wicked people speak a lot and do not even a little bit they're doing yet. Nothing. How did 
Avraham knows to pay a phone. If a phone says, ah, you can have it for free between me and you. 400 shekel, it's what? How did Avraham know that he wants the money, this greedy Ephron? How did he know? If you want to give a, give a gift, you don't have to say to the person, ah, it only cost me such and such. Why are you telling him the price? Because in your subconscious, you want to cover what it costs you. Even if in the end you give it for free, but it breaks your heart. You didn't really want to give it. When you want to give a gift, you don't go into the prices. You make sure to peel the sticker off. <laughs> Why? <laughs> that, don't, don't talk to me about money. It's an insult. It's yours. Enjoy it. Goodbye. That's a gift from the heart. Ah, big deal. I only pay $1,000 for it. No big deal. You will deserve a lot more. Once you say that, in your subconscious, you are dying to get paid. Otherwise, you wouldn't go into the amount. So, his name in the pursuit started with a fraud with Vav. I pay Resh Vav Nun, and right after he said 400 shekel, his name changed to a fraud without Vav. In the same verse, the word the fraud appeared twice. One time Ktiv Male, one time Ktiv Chaser. Missing a Vav, why? How much is a fraud in numeric value? 400. The Vav came out, it became 400. Before it was 406. Once he wanted the 400 shekels, Hashem took out the Vav out of his name to make it equal to 400. Meaning, you stupid fool. You have an opportunity to give a gift to the man of God. The person that God loved the most, maybe in history. And you have an opportunity to give him a land. 400, you're already a millionaire. What do you care? And you charge him even more money than what it's really worth? That's what it means to be wicked. I'll never forget one time I had a Georgian guy who walked here in uh, Queens in real estate. Israeli Georgian. Nice guy. And I said, I convinced him to come to Monsi to the yeshiva. He said to me, I would love to come. I mean, after I heard the lectures, I became really Shomer Shabbat now, and I really want to learn. The problem is that my boss won't agree. I said, why? You don't work on a salary. You can do whatever you want. You can tell him you take a month off. He doesn't pay you a weekly salary. It's real estate, it's commission. He said, yeah, but he gave me some advance money. If I want to be in the office to close the deals, he will get angry. I said, how much advance he gave you? $2,000. This was 20 years ago. So it's like 5,000 today, let's say. Okay, for a guy that owns a real estate office, two or 5,000 dollars is basically peanuts. So I say to him, you know what? Don't worry, let me call your boss. I will already convince him. I will already convince him to let go, at least temporarily, for that 2,000 dollars. Okay, I brought him to the yeshiva. One week is in the yeshiva, he's so happy, he's learning. He's on the right path. I called up that boss, a guy, Israeli guy, owns a real estate office here. I said to him, you know, I brought this guy to the yeshiva, he's growing, he's becoming very religious. I know you, you gave him $2,000 up front. I'm here to offer you a deal that he cannot refuse. Let go of the $2,000 and all the Torah is learning, which is millions of mitzvot every month, millions, you will have a share in it. And if you refuse, just give him extension. When one day he's going to go back to business, first thing he'll do is pay you back the money. But until then, please don't bother him with this. I want him to have a peace of mind to learn. No, Kvod Arav, it's hard days now. Uh, you, no, I, I can't really do it. I mean, you're asking for too much. I can't believe you're asking me such thing. He said, I really need the money. Believe me, if I didn't need the money, I wouldn't, I wouldn't insist. He has to come back to the office and walk. This guy was a decent guy. When he saw the guy is not letting go, he had to leave the yeshiva. He left the yeshiva. He went back to the real estate. Anyway, he didn't stay there. He moved to Israel and became Chiloni. Went back to be a goy. 
Later I found out that this low life was a multi-millionaire. 2,000 for him was not even noticeable in his account. He owned tons of real estate and houses. When I spoke to him on the phone, I didn't know how big he is. He's all, he owns a real estate office. Then I found out he has tons of property, this guy. This stupid guy, if he would agree to the deal, today he would have trillions of mitzvot in his account for that lousy $2,000. Now, every sin that this guy committed in the last 20 years, and his children, and grandchildren, until the end of days, it's all his fault, and he's going to pay for every one of their sins. He gained trillions of sins instead of trillions of mitzvot. That's how stupid a person can be when he doesn't understand Aleph Bet of Torah. Because it's written in the book of Jeremiah that Hashem said that he pays reward and punishment according to the fruits of the actions. Not according to the direct actions, according to the fruits of the action. Meaning, you bought feeling to a guy but he doesn't put it. He left it in a closet. You get one mitzvah. You pay uh, over a thousand dollars for a nice pair. He gave it to him. He promised to put it. He did it. What do you get? A donation of a thousand dollars. One time donation. For mitzvah tefillin. If he would put every day, every time he put, goes to your account like you put. So after a year, you would have uh, 300 mitzvot of tefillin, but it's actually 600 because the head is separate and the end is separate. 600 mitzvot of tefillin every multiply by 20 years, a lot of mitzvot, Baruch Hashem. If he puts, if he didn't, we don't have fruits to the action. You should have known where to invest. Invest in someone you know is going to put the tefillin. If you already have to buy someone, make sure at least this person will do it. If you gave a CD to someone to make him religious and you paid a dollar for it, if he became religious, every mitzvah he keeps his children until the end of days goes to your account for that one dollar. If he didn't become religious, you don't get it. It just continued to be who he is. If he listened to the entire 30 hours of a CD, you get the reward of 30 hours of Torah, which is also huge. If he became Shomer Shabbat, every Shabbat he keeps, it counts like you kept. So, it's very good, just like investment in real estate. You invest here, you make 5%. You invest here, you make 50%. You invest over there, you make 1,000%. There's one, one Persian family here in uh, New York. The grandfather told the Shah, the Iranian Shah, he was in France, not the last Shah, the one before. He said to him, I want you to come back to Iran. He said, no, I'm going to need a lot of money to come, to get control. He said to him, I'm going to give you an open check. It was a wealthy Persian Jew. I'll give you an open check. Whatever you need, you write, we need you here. He gave him whatever he gave him. The, he became the king of Iran. Later on, he said to that Persian Jew, I want to make it up to you. Thanks to you, I'm a king. I want you to go by all the territories of this area. Hundreds of acres. A worth nothing. You can buy it for $50,000, the whole place. Because there's no sewer, no light, no roads, no nothing. Just trees and sand and rocks. No one would buy it. So he asked him, why should I buy these places? What am I going to do with that? He said, I'm going to develop it. That's in my mind. We will make roads, sewer, lights, we move all the dirt, you know, and it will become a thousand times more, or who knows, ten thousand times more. That's how they became billionaires. So whatever he gave him, it was a lot. But the peanut, compared to how much the king paid him later on, how he made him a multi-billionaire. What do you see from here? You need to know where to invest and who to invest with. 
if you invest with a wicked crook, not only you don't get a reward, you have to be responsible for all the crimes you commit with your money. You give money to Mechalel Shabbat. What do you think he's going to do with your money? Put gas in his car and drive the entire Shabbat and get Hashem upset. Who became the partner to the crime? The sponsor. You sponsor a lecture of Santa Claus. <laughs> He's going to murder another thousand souls, that lecture. People that listen online. Twist their ideology, make them anti-God. I didn't ask to come to the world. Don't tell me what to do. You have no right to tell me what to do. Promoting rebellion against Hashem. People rebel against Hashem. Promoting the opposite of what the Torah say to promote. You invited him, you sponsored the lecture, all the scenes that comes out of that night, it's all on you. You have to pay for all of them forever. You're not gonna get one discount. Why? Because you're not allowed to bring heretic people to speak. If you're the rabbi of a shul, you have to think a million times who comes to speak and who will not allow to even step in. You don't just bring everyone. You're not allowed. I want to bring a general in the Israeli army to give us a motivational speak. Who is he? Some gay, Mechalel Shabbat. Doesn't believe in God. When he wins, he doesn't give credit to God. Ah, enough with your God. It's thanks to us, Tzal. You want to bring him to a religious community to brainwash the kids? That God, leave God out of it when he does all the job for us? Do you really think the army can do anything without God? As great as they are, and I have a great uh, appreciation to them, but I, you have to be stupid to think that any army in the world can succeed even a little bit without God's willing. If he doesn't want, nothing can happen. Nothing. But some people do that mistakes. Bring some Christian speaker to speak. Bring a Muslim imam in... Uh, in uh, Toronto, there's a guy there, in my, he's in my blacklist. Someone called me up, he said, you're not gonna believe what's happening here in the shul. What? Lots of Muslim guys are exchanging telephone numbers with the Jewish girls in the ladies section. I said, ma? He said, yes. The stupid uh, uh, heretic rabbi over here from the university in Manhattan invited an imam to speak, a Muslim imam, and you have to see how he kisses up to that imam. What are you, what are you normal? This all Islam is a fake religion. Why you bring a representative of Islam to speak in a holy place of God? This is a heretic religion, it's a made-made religion. There is no prophet Muhammad, it's all baloney. Some men who claim to be a prophet. You can never be a prophet. It's not one prophecy in the Quran. Besides calling, killing everyone and destroying the world, what did it go, give to the world? There are some decent things over there. They copy it from the Torah. We don't need it. We had it 2,000 years before. How do you let him step inside? What is the point of it? Someone sponsored that event. Some fool sponsored it. Everything that happened that night, and if a Jewish girl would go and make a scene, commit a scene with one of the guys over there, they go in, he has to pay for that thing. Why? Because he's the one who sponsored it. When you sponsor a soccer team in Israel who plays on Shabbat, you become responsible for all the Chilulei Shabbat of all the fans. It's all on you. When you sponsor a yeshiva that sits and learns Torah all the Shabbat, all the mitzvot, you're responsible for that. Do you get the point or no? There is no room for mistakes here. I told some of the people, do not ever give a penny to anyone before you ask me first. And some of them, they have good heart. Everyone who comes to cry to them, immediately they want to give them. But after they got burned a few times, they call me now and they tell me, I ask them question. Sometimes the answer is give. Sometimes the answer is do not dare to give. You just got saved from a horrible sin. Just like in finance, if you have a good advisor, he will tell you where to invest, where not to invest. If he will tell you the wrong advice, you can become bankrupt in three months. Do you know that banks that collapsed a few months ago? 
the Israeli high-tech lefty liberals heretic, they were so angry at the religious people in Israel, they decided to move all the money out of Israel and invest it in America. From all the banks, which bank they chose? The Silicon Valley Bank. Five hours later, the bank collapsed. A hundred million dollars went down the drain. Who gave them the advice to invest in a high-tech bank? I'm sure they asked someone. He just made them lose a hundred million. Of course, it's Hashem. Hashem wanted these wicked people who hate religion so much and make a show now. We're going to destroy Israel. We will destroy the economy. We'll move all the money out. You're not going to touch the Supreme Court. They move all the money out and Hashem wiped out the bank. Very possible that Hashem wiped out that bank just because of them. That bank, not everyone got money. The bank here for the religious people, the public bank in Brooklyn, that bank, <laughs> it's very interesting, all the customers of that bank are all religious Jews. All real estate Hasidim, all the religious people. That Shabbat, I remember speaking to my friend Friday before Shabbat. I told him I heard the bank went bankrupt. I know he's sending money to my yeshiva in Yerushalayim every month. I ran to see a copy of the check and I saw that your account is in that bank. He said to me, not only my account, all my money in life is in that bank. That was Friday before Shabbat. Motze, the whole Shabbat, I was upset for this guy. I said, wow, how will Hashem do it to him after he sponsor Kiruv, Torah? Motze Shabbat, they announced the government took over and they'll pay all the people their money in full. It's very interesting because sometimes it's an advantage to collapse first. Because the government has X amount of money to bail out banks. They cannot bail 5,000 banks. So the first one that collapsed, this bank, it's not such a big bank, signature bank. The government can still take over. But what happened if 50 other banks would go? At one point, they said, okay, FDIC, wait 99 years for your 250,000. The rest you lost. The people, all the religious people, which thousands of thousands of business people in New York area, their bank collapsed and the government covered everything. Why? Because Hashem said so. Hashem didn't want them to lose their money. But Hashem wanted them to see that he made them an unbelievable miracle and saved them. To see, and I, I told him, no Motsi Shabbos. He said, what a hard Shabbat I had. I was already thinking, what do I do Monday morning? I cannot write checks, my office, my employees, all my mortgages, this. I don't know, I mean, I mean, I don't even know how to think about this. And guess what, when I open up the phone on Motsi Shabbat, what a relief. Abotai, so Abraham now comes to buy the cave for Sarah. So Abraham needs to bury Sarah. A phone talks a lot, but even a little bit it didn't do. I want to give you a little preview for tomorrow. Tomorrow, there's not a shame in Brooklyn. I'm going to speak about something that will teach us a lot in life. How Abraham sends his servant Eliezer to find a wife to his son. How do you find a wife to your son or to your daughter, a husband? What's priority and what's not? What you're allowed to flesh with, what you have to hide. It's things that are relevant to every human being. Why Abraham warns Eliezer not to get him any girl from the nation of Canaan, when at the same time his family is also wicked. Lavan, Betuel, they're nothing better. Zenevelav is a trefa. It's like you say, I don't want you to get my son any wife from this city. Why? Tel Aviv. Nobody is there is Yerushalayim. Only for my family. Excuse me, and your family, where do they live? In Haifa. And they're not exactly religious. If you tell me, don't dare to find my wife, my husband, my son, Shidduch, from Tel Aviv. Make sure it's from Bnei Brak or Yerushalayim. No, I get the point. 
But if you tell me, don't tell from Tel Aviv, get them from uh, South San Francisco. <laughs> what's the difference, Tel Aviv or San Francisco? We have to understand what's happening here. When you read it every year, if you don't understand the secrets here, what's going on, every word makes a big difference here. Like I always say, every sentence in the Torah, it's a school for life. Even someone like me, and nobody like me, could have given you a month's speech about every parasha. A month. With so much to learn from every parasha. If you will be Chacham of Adia, I can give you 10 years speech on each parasha. 10 years. I will not end. Do you know how much you learn from every word? Do you know how many lessons for life you get? How to behave, how to raise children, and your marriage, interacting with people, Jews, non-Jews, Jews and Jews, Gentiles and Gentiles. So many things in each parasha, it's hard to believe. Of course, some parashot are more than others. Some parashot are not so relevant today. It's all sacrifices, this, koanim, sefer vaikra, okay. But some parashot, it's a school for life. Modesty, sarah, beauty of a woman, what comes first, ideology, you know, what, if you have a, a, a personality issues or ideology, ideology issues. And you have to choose one of the two. You must choose one. What's worse, to be wicked in ideology or wicked in personality? We will find out tomorrow. But there's also a lot of interesting things. I wrote some nice comments today. So Bezrat Hashem will see you tomorrow in Brooklyn, 8.15. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanani Abel HaKashia Amen Atzah, Kedosh Pachu Lezakot, Yisrael, Nefi Kach, Hirvala, Torah Mitzvot.